Right. I welcome members to the 10th meeting in 2014 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. As ever, I uh, remind people uh, both in the committee and otherwise to switch off mobile phones as they can affect uh, the broadcasting system. Uh, agenda item one is uh, to consider taking uh, items in private. Um, do we agree that our consideration of a draft report in the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006 and our work programme be taken in private at future meetings? Do members agree? Thank you very much. Um, the next item is to consider items six and seven on cross-party groups and committees meeting at the same time in chamber, uh, whether we shall take uh, those items in private. Do members agree to take those items today in private? Agree. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item three is, uh, relates to our inquiry uh, into procedures for considering legislation. Um, members will be aware that we had two public engagement events in Glasgow and in Stirling in the last couple of weeks. And uh, I'd like to just uh, get some on the record feedback from some of those who, who participated. Uh, Fiona McLeod, Cameron Buchanan, Margaret Duke McDougall and myself uh, were at them. Uh, who, who might want to kick off on Glasgow, Fiona or Cameron? Um, can, can I first start by saying I was at the, the Glasgow one. I thought it was incredibly well organised, not just from our side, but from ACVO. Um, a lot of people there who came and truly engaged um, with how the Parliament goes about legislation. Two of the things that I picked out from that day was there's great concern about timings, um, especially about stage two and stage three amendments, and that... Now, these were all policy officers, so they're quite ve well versed in this, but what they were talking about was um, needing supporting documents at all stages of the process, um, and particularly in terms of amendments, looking to see supporting documents from the lodgers of amendments with a clear policy intent about what the amendments are for and how it will affect the overall. And if I can, having read the paper on Stirling, um, I was delighted, of course, to read that the people of Stirling thought that we should reinstate the Parliament's partnership libraries. <laughs> Cameron? I was just going to say, I thought, thank you, um, good morning. Um, I thought it was very interesting in Glasgow also that we had a, a couple of former MSPs there who were very useful and gave us um, Ian Smith and um, the guy from the Greens. Um, Mark Ballard, who was there. And that was very useful because they gave us the sort of timetables and also gave us what they thought was wrong as well from an insider point of view. And it was realistically, I think, that the timing was, was, was the thing that was wrong. The timing of the bills and everything which we're going to be discussing. That's all I've really got to say on that. Okay, that's, that's fine. Should we um, see Margaret if you want to add anything that comes out of our sterling? Yeah, I find it very interesting and particularly in that the people who were there were from volunteer sector and you know they were there to support people as well there was people there from a domestic violence support group and um, their difficulty was around that communication and the, not everybody had access to the internet the literacy problems so how do we get that information across to them and also the the network group representative who was there said it was very difficult to actually disseminate the information once they had found it. They all seemed to have difficulty in finding it. And also, they didn't know actually how to go about getting a, a cause into the Parliament and what they did in the process of that. So uh, I think they found it very useful uh, themselves and certainly uh, I found it informative as well. So. These were people who liked the informal session, who wouldn't normally be faced on these benches, some of these people like that from, um, was it Children First and that uh, um, women, women, for group, women for Women group, who would never come to the Parliament, had never been and really had no intention of going. And these sort of informal sessions I thought were very useful because it did give us the basis and the sort of outreach thing of the Parliament, which I think is so important and that's what was so good. I, th I, th I think it too was uh, quite interesting to get as a group who 
are not so directly engaged in the process and see, see their views. And um, I, th I think, too, it would be fair to say they went away having learned quite a lot, as well as our having learned uh, from, 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 from them. Uh, now, colleagues, we, we will, of course, have a, a formal report that the clerks will prepare for us, and we'll, we'll, we'll publish at a later date uh, that uh, will come out of our, uh, our two visits. But I think, uh, as a committee, it's about the process of Parliament. It was quite a, uh, an enlightening couple of events to go out and engage with the real public, um, because the public are often kept pretty distant uh, from the processes, and perhaps our views of the processes are often about what serves us best as those who are involved in the processes. And this was an opportunity to see what will serve the people we really serve out in the public uh, better. So I think it was a, a very worthwhile initiative on our part that uh, everybody, uh, everybody who came and visited uh, played a very helpful, uh, very helpful part in. Right, is anything, anyone else got uh, anything they wish to say on this subject before I move on to the next agenda item? Right, the uh, next agenda item is, uh, uh, again, related to our procedures uh, on considering legislation. Uh, we have a panel of witnesses before us today. Um, let me just uh, go from left to right. And, uh, on our left, we have Stuart Fobisher, Divisional Solicitor, Director for Legal Services. And next to him, we have Stephen McGregor, Primary Legislation Programme Manager, Cabinet, Parliament and Governance Division, uh, Scottish Government. Then, of course, we have the Minister, Joe Fitzpatrick, the Minister for Parliamentary Business. And on his left, we have Willie Ferry, who's Scottish Parliamentary Council, Office of the Scottish Parliamentary Council. Now, it's not usually my habit to uh, invite opening statements, uh, but on this occasion, I perhaps uh, will give the Minister the opportunity just to make any comments he wishes to make at this stage. I, mean, I think, obviously, my opening remarks would be similar to the written evidence that, that we gave. Um, so just to, to very quickly emphasise that we do welcome the committee's inquiry. I think it's absolutely appropriate that the Parliament um, regularly review, periodically reviews um, our, our systems and to make sure that they remain fit for purpose and to, to, to look at how we can continue to improve the, the, the Parliament's process. And so it has been very interesting for us to, to look at the evidence sessions that you've had, both written and, and oral sessions, and to, and to hear just now about some of the public engagement that you've been doing as part of that process, which I think is one of the, the, the in, increasing strengths of, of, of our Parliament. Um, I, th I wonder if it might be possible for all, all of my colleagues to just introduce themselves in terms of the, just very quickly what they do as part of, the, of our team. That, that's helpful, so, Minister. You've anticipated what I was doing. Well, I'm Roy Ferry from the Office of the Scottish Parliamentary Council. Our office is responsible for the drafting of the bills that form the, the government's uh, legislative programme, including the, uh, the, the, the amendments uh, to, to, to bills. <clears throat> I'm Stephen McGregor. I work in Cabinet, Parliament and Governance Division. I lead the Scottish Government's legislation team, so I'm responsible for coordinating the Scottish Government's legislative programme. So I work closely with individual bill teams to do that, as well as the Minister. I'm Stuart Fubister from the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. I have a coordinating role uh, in respect of SGLD's interest in primary legislation. Uh, SGLD is responsible for instructing all government bills uh, and associated legal work in taking them through. Uh, thank you very much. That's very helpful. I will, at the end, uh, come back to the panel just to give you the opportunity, if you think in our questioning we've missed something that you, you want to bring to our attention. So as you're going along, you might care to be thinking about that. Right, Fiona. Thank you. Morning. Um, I've been pursuing very much um, stage one of the legislative process, and what's come out of the evidence there is that most witnesses have said that stage one process is good, fairly robust, doesn't need a lot of changes. But what people have been talking about is pre-stage one, so pre-legislative consultation, um, draft bills, that sort of thing. So the, the committee's begun to hear some good statistics on what the government already does, and I wondered if the minister would want to talk about that pre-legislative part. Yeah, I mean, obviously, most of what, what we're looking at in terms of, of, of the, the committee's inquiry is about the, the, the actual Parliament's process from stage one to stage three. But, of course, the, 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 the whole process is, begins long before that and continues after that in implementation. Um, so pre-stage pre, um, 
pre a bill being produced, um, there is a, a huge amount of engagement. One of the ways that we can do that is using a, a draft bill. And um, I think it's been pretty consistent that about 25% of bills through all, all the sessions of the Parliament have, be, have had a draft bill attached. And I think that's probably, is, is, is when it's appropriate, it's very, very helpful. I'm not sure it would be beneficial for every single bill to have a draft bill. That would be... Um, for, for some bills, it just wouldn't be appropriate. Um, so we, we already do that for about 20, 25% of bills, um, and, and I, I think that is helpful. I wonder one of the areas that, that we were kind of thinking when we've been looking at this process is whether that the Parliament could engage more in that, the stages prior to um, a bill being, being introduced, um, and, and whether they could somehow take part in, in, in the work that the government does in, in consultation before clearly not to form a, a final view, and, and the committees would always want to um, protect their, their, their position in, in then um, scrutinising a bill that finally came forward, but it would offer an opportunity for members of, of specialist committees who've developed specialist knowledge in an area to um, feed into the government's thinking in terms of developing a bill at an earlier stage, and I think that might be helpful. So in t in t that's quite interesting because in terms of that, because this committee always comes back to do we need to change standing orders to make something happen? Um, so if we want to get the committees to engage in that pre-legislative consultation process that the government's already doing, do we need to have a standing order change or do we need to just highlight the fact that committees should be I, I don't think that? there would be any need for a standing order change to allow um, committees to take part in pre-legislative scrutiny. In fact... Um, a number of committees already do that. I mean, I think the Education Committee did a, a, a fair bit of engagement prior to the Children and Young People's Bill coming forward. They knew it was coming, they, and, and so they, they started doing some work. Um, the Rural Affairs and Climate Change Committee are currently um, doing some scrutiny in terms of land reform um, in, in advance of a, a, later, a later bill. Um, so it is possible, and it actually does happen, and I think when it happens, it means that the committee members um, are then able to engage in stage one from a, a much higher um, level of understanding of, of, of the government's thinking and the, and the thinking of stakeholders. But there might be a, an additional opportunity to, um, to engage with the, the government's consultation process as well. That probably doesn't happen very much just now. But none of that, I, I think, would need um, standing order changes that would simply, you know, maybe, maybe we should highlight the fact that it's, the opportunity exists. I think, because your examples, because I was, when I was on Health and Sport Committee, we did that knowing that the integration agenda was coming, so they did a short um, inquiry before that and it did help. Um, can I then go on to one of the other items that... Sorry, just sorry if, if we're moving on, I, I just wonder, before we left that subject, if there was a view in the panel that that might be helpful to those who are contributing to consultations, in that presently they may have to contribute to the government's consultation and then to the committee's consultation. And perhaps, you know, it might make it more simple and straightforward, or would it carry the risk of denying them the opportunity of second thoughts when the committee came? Or is it a question of horses for courses? I, I think it probably is to some extent horses for courses, but I think any involvement of committee in pre-legislative scrutiny would never it would have to not debar the committee from making decisions about how they would then scrutinise any bill that then came out of that. So I think, I think that would be a, a very important principle to maintain. Um, that, that, you know, the, the opportunity for, for this would be an additional opportunity not, not, not taken away at all from the, the stage one scrutiny. So one of the other um, areas that's come out is about the uh, documents that accompany um, bills when they're introduced and you know, that's laid down what documents we have to introduce um, and in what format. Um, is there, have you got any sort of thoughts on do we need to change the way we do that to make them more accessible? I think um, that they're, they're in, in the main, I think the, the documents are, are, are very robust. Um, we, we've had a, a look at um, the company documents over the, the session of Parliament and maybe Stephen will, will, will shortly talk about how they have grown in size and, and complexity since the, the first session to, to what we, we now have. Um, but um, I think there, there may be an issue in terms of how accessible all the documents are um, to 
um, members of Parliament and members of the public, and, and so that that's certainly I think something that we, we should look at. I mean, for instance, the financial memorandum is hidden away almost, um, and, and so whether each of the each of the documents should perhaps be individual documents. Um, more easily accessible. So if somebody wants to find the financial memorandum, it should be relatively easy for them to find that as, as a document in its own right. So and we should look at how, how we can better improve that. I think um, one of the ways forward for that is, is um, how, how we use the internet more. I know not everyone has access to the internet, but increasingly it is becoming the way that people access information and it does give us opportunities to improve access and make it m um, much simpler for people to, to find the information they want and access these documents. Accompanying documents are, I think, very helpful to um, the, the Parliament and, and, and Government as well. Um, and so, so we, we, I think we should continue to try to improve them. One of the challenges we have is, is, is sometimes knowing exactly what the Parliament wants in an accompanying document, and, and that might be why, over time, documents have just got bigger and bigger. And yet, and yet sometimes we still hear that it's not doing what we want. So I think there is a need for a, a, a discussion between the, par the Parliament and, and Government to work out some sort of guidelines about what is expected to be within a financial memorandum, for instance. And, and let's, let's, because what, what exists in terms of guidelines just now are very high, high level guidelines. And, and clearly, sometimes that's what, what we produce is exactly what a committee wants. And, and sometimes it's not what a committee wants. And I think we need to have a better understanding of, of, of what it is that, 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 Parliament's, that Parliament wants from, from, the, um, from the documents. But maybe Stephen could talk a bit about, about some of the documents and how they've changed over time. I did a quick check back from 1999. I think the average size of the financial memorandum in the first session was three pages, and the second session was nine pages, the third session was 15 pages, and the current session is 21 pages. So we're definitely providing more information, but it's whether it's the right information or not. So. And we have been engaging with the, uh, the Parliament on this. We've invited the Parliament to contribute to training we provide for bill teams, and we're quite keen to continue that, but also develop some guidance line behind that so um, we can understand as far as we can what information the Parliament would like to see, and then we're able to try and provide that for you. I think that's really, so the librarian just finds that really interesting because it's not about access to the quantity of information, it's the quality. Are we putting out the stuff that actually supports the bill and helps? all stakeholders to understand what it's about. So it's interesting to, to hear that we're working on that. I mean, one of the things that in, in terms of discussion, we, we always try and do things by, by discussion with, with, um, with Parliament and with committees. And, and um, DPLR, for instance, have um, raised concerns about um, the, the DPM not including guidance and direction-making powers. And you know, standing orders don't require that. There's, there's probably not a good reason for it not to do so. Um, so if that was something that, that you might want to look at, then... I think, I think it might be surprising if we were not to uh, agree with DPLR on that particular subject. Perhaps uh, another one which has arisen uh, in other contexts is in relation to financial memoranda and other supporting documents, but particularly financial memorandum which, of course, is required to be passed by Parliament at stage one uh, and is required to be updated if it's updated, but is not required to be re-endorsed by Parliament. If we were to consider that when the financial memorandum changes, it requires to be re-endorsed by Parliament, do you, do you have a view on uh, what, what, what the implications of that might be? I think we need to be clearly... Um, we want to give Parliament as much information and as much time to consider documents that are produced as, as possible. And um, normally we, we, we get that right. We do need to be careful that we're not um, putting barriers in the way that would make it very difficult for legislation to proceed. <coughs> um, Cle clearly, Minister, if uh, an updated financial memorandum is underpinning uh, what's now happening, it, it, it's part of what Parliament receives when it decides what it's going to do at stage two and stage three. So I can see an argument on both, both sides that it will be considered as part of the input. It doesn't seem unreasonable that Parliament in, in some way is able to express a view on, on that. Okay. Cameron? Sorry. 
How do you respond to the concerns set, setting an end point by which the bill must complete its passage through Parliament? How do you respond to that? Because we've had criticism at the stage, the time between stages two and three, or criticism, comment, I should say. I, to, 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 often the, the timings for a bill are maybe driven by a desire to implement the bill and, and what the bill does, we, we, it's, it's something we want to, to, to be implemented um, in, a, in a time scale. So that is sometimes the a driver for for the the end timescale, but normally um, we look at timescales in collaboration with um, the lead committee, and and to to try and work out what time is required for the for the different stages. Um, obviously, there are occasions when we don't get that quite right, and you know we're always keen to listen. And if representations are made to us that that the, the timescales aren't right and aren't allowing proper scrutiny, um, then we, we would look to be flexible. And I think the example of, of the government being flexible um, in such a, a case was the Children and Young People's Bill, <coughs> where um, there was expressions of concern that the time wasn't available between the stages um, for stakeholders and, 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 and DPLR committee to, um, to look at amendments um, and, and be extended that, that period to allow for that. So gov government um, would always listen to representations, but you know sometimes there is a driving a driver that at the end we we, you know, we we want to get bills passed for a reason. There's a purpose behind the legislation that the parliament is is bringing taking forward, and we, we have a you know pretty good record over the the four sessions of parliament of 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 taking forward legislation, which I think in the main um, we all agree is is designed to improve the lives of people in Scotland. There is a fixed time then between the stages that's set down, but it can be extended. Is that what you're saying? I mean, there's a fixed time between yeah. stages one, there, two, there and three. Are, there are there are there are minimum minimum time scales in in the in the standing orders, and perhaps sometimes we work to those minimums a bit more than we should. And I, and I think um, as a, an outcome of of the evidence that you have already taken, um, we will be looking more carefully at. at why there's a need to work to minimum timescales. Sometimes there will be, an, and I think we would want to maintain the flexibility um, so that, that where it's appropriate, that that, that can, um, that, that timescales could be set to those minimums, but we would, um, we will try not to work to minimum timescales, and that, that's kind of a, a, a general um, thrust that, that, that we have um, put out across government in terms of the, the bill teams that they shouldn't be expecting to work to the minimum time scales. I think we heard from people like Shelter that they said there was a, a the deadline for lodging amendments was very difficult and they wanted, should that be extended for lodging amendments, they found it quite difficult to, I think it was Shelter that said that, I can't remember it was, yeah, that said that the dead, these professional, you know, the people who come in all the time, sometimes there wasn't enough time to lodge the amendments. And I, I guess what we need to, to be careful of is, in, on one hand, if you give more time for lodging amendment, then does that take away from the time to then consider the amendments and... Um, particularly with stage twos, if it's a big complex bill and you, each amendment um, stage um, in, in the committee would have consequences for the next stage. So um, there, there are implications. But I think it's reasonable for, for the committee and, and we'd be happy to engage the committee to look at whether um, guidance can be produced which um, ensures that wherever possible there is more, more time as, as is appropriate depending on the bill. Okay. Thank you very much, Camille. Um, moving on to stage three, um, during our evidence sessions, um, there has been a general consensus that stage three does need to be reformed in some way. So do you think that stage three should be structured diff uh, differently? Um, should it be given more time? And how, how do you feel about perhaps um, splitting stage three so that amendments are considered on a separate day um, to the actual debate of, of the bill? Um, stage. St stage three is obviously the final consideration of, of this Parliament setting legislation. So I think it's a very, very important um, part of the of our, of our processes. Standing orders already allows for us to split stage three into in, to do the amendments on one day and 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 a, and, a, and a debate on another day, either the next day or, or the following week, um, where it's deemed to be appropriate. But I guess um, we've not particularly looked at using that option very much in, in recent times. And, and again, um, 
from hearing the evidence from, from this committee, that's certainly something that we will look more actively at for future bills. So for bills which are currently in session and, and ones coming um, down the line, we'll certainly more look more carefully at whether it would be appropriate for the amendment stage to, to be on one day and, and then the, the debate stage of, um, to be on, a, on another day. One thing I, I feel very strongly about is that um, there should be time to debate stage three of amendment of stage three of, of a bill, both amendments, um, and and um, on the in the debate section of that of, of the stage three. Um, the, the process that we, we go through is um, the the bill team and the, and the parliament look at the amendments that come forward. And they make a best best estimate as to the time that it will take um, to to go through amendments. Um, I then share that best estimate with business managers across the parliament, and they would generally then speak to their spokespeople to say, "Look, is this right, or do we want to speak more?" And on some occasions, um, a business manager will come back saying, "You know, we think that we're going to need we're, we're we're going to want to speak more in this section of amendments." Um, and, so, and so we would ex extend the time um, based on, on that information. Um, however, it's still going to be an estimate. Until you actually sit in the chamber and the debate happens and you, and you hear the contributions, you can't actually know um, how much time you need in order not to curtail the debate. Obviously, the presiding officer has flexibility within standing orders to, to move a rule, to extend a session, but then it, that only happens once, and then we have this kind of slightly clunky situation of moving a motion without notice and I just wonder whether the PO should have more flexibility um, in order to, 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 to make sure that the debate is not curtailed throughout the amendment stage and of, of course the PO has always got the flexibility to delay decision time to ensure further contributions are enabled at stage three. So I think it's a very important part of, of, of the, the process and um, I think the key is, is, is that the, the, maybe the PO doesn't have quite the flexibility written in, in clear standing orders that, that, that um, might ensure that that can happen all the time. And, so, and sometimes it does feel a, a little bit rushed. And Just as a follow-up to that, some of the stakeholders that we've had in front of us would think, um, have said that they think it would be valuable to have the Stage 3 debate in advance of the amendments. Um, so how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I, I certainly... Um, particularly heard the comments of Mr Adam and, and Mr Buchanan um, around this area and I, and I, I understand the, the concerns about you You go into stage three and all of a sudden you can be discussing what might be very technical amendments on a bill and you've got perhaps people in the audience who um, like came to hear this, this important debate on a subject and they're, they're hearing people talking about things which they don't, doesn't seem to fit in. Um, um, however, the debate is um, the, 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 the minister or the member in charge moving the motion that we accept the bill as amended. So clearly that can't start until after the amendment say, has, has happened. However, I, 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 mean, I, I do understand that, that, that it just seems a bit strange that there isn't anything to put the amendment stage in context and um, without particularly pushing out a government line I wondered whether uh, th th there was a, a missing stage in terms of a handover from the committee, which has dealt with stage two, and handing over to the plenary session at stage three, and whether there might be an opportunity for the convener of that committee to, in a, a neutral way, as conveners often manage to do, to basically um, talk to what happened at stage two. You know, the, the, the bill was in the, in the plenary session in the parliament at stage one, it went to committee at stage two, and it's coming back to the, the Parliament Stage 3, so whether there's an opportunity for the convener to talk to what happened in Stage 2, and that might then set the Stage 3 debate in some context, um, rather than starting straight in with, with amendments. But I, I do think that the, the, the debate stage has to happen after the, after the amendments, because you're the member in charge or, um, or the minister are, are moving the motion that, that, is, that the bill is accepted as amended. We, we, I'm thinking on my feet, you're sort of leading me to, to this, whether um, the model that we occasionally use in relation to statements, ministerial statements, where we have the statement without interruption and then a debate on the statement, you know, you, you, you can do things. And I wonder whether uh, what you're saying lead, leads us to think that one might start the stage three amendment process 
with a statement from the member in charge, from the committee convener, and perhaps one other, to just set a context for that amendment stage. Would that be something that... No, I, I, I'm I, not necessarily I, looking for a definitive no, answer. I, 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 think, I think perhaps there's a potential here to, to look at whether there's options to then set the, the debate in context. But it does seem that there's, a, there's, there's something missing in terms of reporting back mm -hmm. from the committee to the Parliament as a whole in terms of what happened. And, and you're know, the right person to do that, and the only person that probably could do that in a, an entirely neutral way would be the convener of the committee. Um, it's the public. Also, that don't understand what happens, and people yeah. just disappear if you notice out of the, out of the chamber and the gallery at, at that end, and that's the problem. I think it's a, it looks bad for the parliamentary point of view. I didn't understand mm -hmm. as a relatively new, new member why we debated something at the end either. So I think something needs to change, but I can't exactly say what it is. But I don't think it's quite right as we found said at the time. I think that's set, set something that um, we'd be happy to discuss with. Uh, before we move off, just perhaps seek Stephen uh, McGregor's view and some of the mechanics that might be around and then this if he's the right person to respond to, to, the, to the question I have in my mind. Um, at the moment it does seem that the publication, republication of the bill after amendment at stage three takes place on the day after. Is that a, a practical normal timetable so that if we were to separate the the stage three debate on the bill from the stage three amendment consideration, one, I would imagine one would wish to do so in the context of having the amended bill in front of you. What, what, what are the practicalities associated with that? Or I'm choosing, Stephen, that maybe I see Willie Ferry nodding, <laughs> suggesting perhaps it's his question. No, I think maybe I can answer that because our office would be involved in preparing the as amended print in conjunction with the with the clerks, and it normally would be produced overnight. Certainly, they would always aim to produce uh, an as amended print overnight. But sometimes, on long bills or very big bills that have been heavily amended, it may take a couple of days in order to have an as amended print available. But normally, they would aim to have the bill available and published on the Parliament's website by the following day. So, the as amended print should be available if the, the debate section were separated from the amended. Uh, so be very precise. When you say on the following day, what time on the following day? Well, normally we'd aim to publish bills by about 8 o'clock on the Parliament's website. And we right. would normally get an advanced draft of the bill as amended on the assumption that certain amendments are going to be voted in, so we, we, we'd get a chance to check it in advance, and then we'd have to just check it against you know, how the votes actually went so, on the day. So, so just looking at the mechanical side of this, if we were to have the debate on the bill on the day following, we would, in general terms, have the morning as members to consider that amended bill um, and incorporate that in the remarks we might make in the debate. But, but we would be unwise on the basis of what you've said to mandate that that would, yeah. that would be the following day. Yeah. I would just caution because sometimes with big bills it can no, no, be I a think, couple of days. To I, th I, th I think that point's quite clearly understood. And I just wanted to make sure we got the mechanical bit of it. The only thing I would want to say in, in those terms of, of, about um, <coughs> separating the amendment stage and the debate stage is that we wouldn't want that to be laid down in firm, because I'm not sure it would be appropriate for every bill, but you know, it's certainly something that we appreciate based on the evidence that, that your committee has received that would be appropriate for some bills, and there are a couple of bills that I'm actively considering whether it is appropriate for, for those bills. I, th I think, Minister, given that standing orders permit this, and it is occasionally done, the committee might limit itself to making a recommendation. But, I, but I'm anticipating what my colleagues uh, might, 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 uh, might come up with, and uh, perhaps we might change the debate stage, actually call it the decision stage rather than stage three, so that the public understood. Come on. But stage three could be split either, and I oh, don't yes. know if everybody else is aware of that. It has happened. It has, is it? I no. mean, as a relative new member, I wasn't aware. And I think that's useful to say that. It's, it's also fair to say, of course, that for big bills, the stage three amendment part can straddle more than one day, because sometimes you can't fit it in a single day. Um, so the, 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 the Parliament rules are more flexible than we sometimes imagine they are when we look at the practice uh, of Parliament. Anything else, Cara? Um, just finally, um, I think it was possibly the Law Society that mentioned the idea of maybe having a, some sort of sense check um, after amendments have been passed at stage three before sort of proceeding any further with the bill becoming um, a, a formal decision. So, I mean, what are your views on that? 
again, again, there is the opportunity for a, a sense, sense check. It does exist within in the standing orders. The, the member in charge of the minister can can um, effectively call a halt to, to proceedings and, and, and go back to make um, some correcting amendments. I think that's happened on one occasion in 2006. Yep, uh, in 2006, where 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 that did happen, um, and. And it might be a reason for why, from a, a, a bill with a lot of very complex amendments, that you would want to have that um, separated um, decision time between um, the amendment stage and the, and, and the, the decision, because it would then give time for that sense check to be done, um, and and then such a such a motion to be moved to, to allow for amendments. But um, Stephen, do you want to? No, I think that's just it. If, if in a, a big bill, if we split the um, stage three into two parts and have the amendments in one day and the stage three debate the following week or even later than that, that provides the opportunity to, to have that final look at the technical correctness of the bill and, if necessary, for it to be tidied up. Uh, it, it is possible, I understand, for corrections to be made to the text as long as they don't affect the effect. Uh, already, would you would you kind of speak to that? I mean, I, I, you know, when I took climate change through, for example, we because of the huge number of amendments and the fact that in this particular case we had to vote on a consequential before we voted in the substantial. None of us twigged that we voted in a consequential and then voted down the substantial. So we had a reference to something that wasn't in the bill, and that was simply corrected by essentially taking out the reference? Well, there's two processes. There's one, there's the formal process, which we've discussed, that if you have the split, you can bring forward actual amendments to correct the errors, and that might have helped in that case and might have helped in the few other occasions, occasions when there have been slip-ups. There is some limited scope to make what are known as printing changes, uh, which is something that the, we would discuss with the clerks, but it's there's an obvious uh, error, uh, or usually for printing errors and typographical errors, where we can correct it with a clear sense of what Parliament had intended uh, to achieve was perhaps not made clear and could be made clear simply by a, by a printing error. But And certainly at the last stage, if you're at stage three and you're beyond the point when you can amend again, then the, the only the only kind of opportunity you have then is to do printing changes. And they're not things, obviously, that are put before members or they're not things that are necessarily scrutinised. So we'd only use them very, very rarely. But if there was the opportunity to have the split, then you could also take the opportunity to do a formal clarificatory uh, uh, amendment. So the scope for doing those printing changes can be quite limited, that's all I would say. So the printing changes can be used and have been used yes. to affect technical errors in the draft that now has resulted from the parliamentary process, as long as it doesn't change the intent of the bill. Is, is, that, is that capturing what happens? I don't want to bounce you into a description I'm giving you if you are uncomfortable with it. Uh, I mean, there are, as I say, there are limits. I mean, clearly, we can't. If, if Parliament has voted on a particular amendment, we can't undo that vote in many respects. But if, in that, as in that instance, there's a cross-reference to something which is wrong or just doesn't exist, then clearly you can address that particular issue as a printing change. But we certainly can't use printing changes to undo something that Parliament has clearly agreed to. Right. That's that's a, a more adequate description, perhaps, than the one that I uh, I chose to to give, Margaret. Thank you, convener. And we're moving on to amendments and basically people's understanding of them and why they have been uh, submitted. So do you have any suggestions on how the consideration of amendments in committee and the chamber could be made more transparent? I think one of, one of the, the big challenges is for particularly members of the public to understand where an, an amendment fits in to the... Um, into the bill, and you, you know, in order to do that, you'd have to have the amendment there, which says delete part of something, and it, in itself, it tends often doesn't mean anything at all. Um, and you'd have to have then the bill beside it, and somehow be able to score out the bit that it's taken out, and then work out how that bit fits in. That's all quite difficult for anyone to do. Um, so I, I mean, I, my view is that this is where technology should be ultimately able to help us, where you would be able to go to a website where you could click on the amendment and it would show up in the bill where that would fit in and how that would change the, the bill. And um, I know there is a, a degree of work ongoing in terms of um, the, the digitisation of the, the bill making process and we would obviously be con content to continue working with the, the Parliament to see how, how we could improve um, 
um, approve that so that there is a, a, a clearer understanding of how amendments interact with, with, with the bills. Um, there is a, a fair bit of work ongoing in terms of a, an IT project, which perhaps Willie might be able to talk about the work that's already ongoing. Um, favour uh, an idea of publishing the amendment with a short explanation of the policy well, and that, thinking that, behind it. That, that would be a, a, a different matter, which perhaps would come on. Do you want to, Willie, yeah. do you want to quickly talk about the, 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 the technology first? Yeah, just on the technological developments, as the Minister has said, there's work <coughs> ongoing at the moment to uh, uh, refresh our bill drafting software, and we in OSPC are working in conjunction with the clerks and the legislation team in the Parliament to develop a new software for the drafting of bills, including amendments and software we currently use dates from 1999 and it's a bit creaky and we need something that's more fit for the digital age. As far as amendments are concerned we want to move away from the system as the Minister described whereby you draft each individual amendment as a separate document separate from the bill and the two have to be looked at uh, separately and what we hope that the software will achieve is that the drafter when doing the amendment will just call up the bill on screen and just type the desired changes straight into the bill so we can see how the, the, the amendments look in the context of the bill and then just press a button and the software will produce the list of amendments. I don't think we can move away from having a, a list of amendments like the Marshall list because the standing orders require that as part of the, the consideration and the, 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 the voting on amendments. But what the new software will produce, hopefully, because the drafters are writing, uh, as they draft the amendments, are effectively writing the amendments into the bill. It should make it more easy to produce a version of the bill with the amendments marked up in them, and that version of the bill could be made available to members and indeed to the public, which might help in making the process more transparent and more easy to understand uh, what amendments are doing in the context of, of the particular bill. We're hoping that the, the software will be available for use by the end of, of, of 2015. That's the current uh, time frame for the project. So, you know, on the, the explanation of why the amendment has come about and the policy thinking behind it, do you think that you know there is the opportunity to actually produce that so that it gives a better understanding for members who are maybe not so closely involved with that particular bill, or you know the, the public? I, I think that it is important that, that, that members in particular have an understanding of, of what the intention behind a, 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 an amendment is, and particularly groups of amendments. Um, we already produce um, some information around the, the intention, some supporting information um, around amendments um, which we share with, with clerks. Obviously that, that work's done for government and that's then shared um, with, with the clerks of the relevant committee. And, and whether that could be shared wider is something we need to, to, to look at. Um, one concern I would have about publishing um, you know, um, effect notes might be that the reliance that courts might then place on such notes and that might then have a big implication for the times um, for the time in terms of producing those notes because you would have to be making absolutely sure that you weren't you know you were legally sound in terms of everything that you were saying in, in the notes because they might be used in court if they were then published so I, I mean I think it's a different thing producing a note of an information, information for members and to something that might end up being used in court because you've published it. Um, but we do already produce that information and, and whether that might be, they might, might be able to look at how that could be shared more widely with, with members, that's probably something that we, we could consider. Um, maybe Stuart, do you want to? Yes. As the Minister says, we would require to, to, to just consider um, some of the implications of um, material like this being used in court. Uh, the general approach of the courts just now is that the bill uh, means what it says. The first point they look at is simply the text of the bill and try and assert parliamentary intention from that. Um, they only really go behind that and look at extraneous materials like debates in Parliament, policy memoranda, explanatory notes, if there's ambiguity in the text of the bill. Um, but it is possible um, if uh, a new element comes in explanatory material uh, offered as a matter of course with amendments that the courts would have a look at that. Um, so, you know, there are issues to consider there. I don't think there's anything insurmountable. I, I think one of, the, one of the other things that I would want to add is very, if, if we were kind of looking to, to improve the information that's available to members, that we continue with the current practice, which would be to produce 
um, information based on groups of amendments. Um, I think it would be very onerous on, um, on government and on, on Parliament if we were saying that you'd have to have an explanatory note for each individual amendment. And actually, it might not be terribly helpful when you've got a group of amendments that do something. Um, what we currently produce um, would be um, notes that explain the, the purpose and effect of, of that group of amendments. And um, you know, we, we do currently share that. I don't know if all members have perhaps seen the sort of detail of notes that we produce. And, um, I could share with the committee the, 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 the notes that we've produced for the, um, it's changed its name, but the defective buildings, Dave Stewart's defective buildings. Um, so maybe I could share the, the explanatory notes that we produced for that and we shared with Mr Stewart and, and, the, and the relevant committee on that occasion. And that. Bring that on the record or for background briefing? I think I would share it with members for background reading if that would be okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I, can I, sorry, Fiona. Can I, can I ask, Stuart, because one of the things that's come up when we've been talking about all the accompanying documents is the spice briefing. Um, now, the spice briefing is not part of the suite of documents that has to be produced, but always is. Because it's not part of the suite that has to be produced, it has no legal standing. Would that be the case? Um, yes, generally. I don't, can't think of particular instances where the courts have had regard to spice briefing. Um, it's a kind of, it's a growing area. I mean, the, the courts, for instance, are having much more regard to policy memoranda than they have in the past, mainly in things like ECHR considerations, you know, thinking about the policy justification, why Parliament has done, done something uh, like that. So the fact that spice briefing comes not, if you like, from a a member or, or, or the, the, yeah, the member in charge of the bill uh, may not mean in the long term that it's something that's considered completely irrelevant. So we should, but we should leave it the way it is um, as a known statutory document that accompanies... I think it, that's probably for the Parliament, but um, given that all the other documentation that's required is produced effectively by the member in charge, by the government, it was a government bill, then the spice briefing is, I think, in a slightly different category. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on uh, amendments where the interaction between consequentials and the substantive amendment and wonder whether it would be useful if the presiding officer had the power to designate that a group of amendments that clearly stood together should be voted on together as a single vote or alternatively, whether the drafting rules, which essentially mean that they have to be broken down into separate amendments because they affect different parts of the bill, rather than submitted as a single amendment which could be voted. And I just have a memory that where we're making amendments to a bill, which in turn are amending pre-existing legislation, we actually can, in those amendments, have scattergun effect. So I wonder if... Th I, th I think... Um, I certainly think that the current situation where we debate a group of amendments and then vote on them in different times, sometimes weeks later, is very confusing for, I think, just about everyone concerned. And um, I, I'm pretty sure that there are times when members vote on amendments that they actually have little recollection of the debate that took place. Um, obviously, we have the challenge of the, the, the rule of progression in terms of moving through the bill, but I just wonder whether we could find a way that if we've debated a suite of amendments in terms of a grouping, then whether you, you, you vote on them as one group, but even if you vote on them all together, then there would be more clarity and from anyone watching and for members who are taking part in the stage two or stage three, um, that, that, that might Im, Im, improve things. But, you know, obviously we have to be careful that we're not, there isn't unintended consequences, so it would be something we need to, to work with Parliament in, in, what, in order to achieve. Are there any legal issues around uh, our changing our approach there? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure there are necessarily any legal issues. It's really just an issue of how you handle the business. I mean, there's always a risk of, if you're t voting through a whole block of amendments in one go that there may be potential for clashes with conflicting amendments that are coming later, but hopefully that's something that can be worked out in the context in which you agree the groupings. 
he makes sure that only the, the, the amendments that are all related to the same topic are grouped together. So I don't know that there's necessarily any kind of particular... So existing provisions and what the presiding officer or convener might say in, pre in relation to preemption, which already is, applied. would simply become perhaps a little more complex? Well, we have to give careful consideration to just exactly what the consequences could be for the managing of the, 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 the proceedings in relation to other amendments or other groups. If we decide to take a, a, a group of amendments on one vote, I mean, there will be issues to consider, like preemptions, for example, and mm. issues around mm. alternative and competing amendments at the same mm. place, where they might be taken on different days. You know, what happens if you voted in a group on one day, but then there's a competing amendment a later day? Uh, which is in the same place. So these issues would have to be thought through carefully. I don't think we can say at this stage it isn't doable, but we just need to make sure we think through these, these, these technical issues in relation to the handling of So of the, 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 the bottom line is if the committee wanted to consider and make comment on this subject, you are not strongly advocating we desist from so doing. That's helpful. Thank you very much. George? Ah, thank you, Convener. I'd like to say, Minister, I quite like the idea of the software for the bill team uh, when, it, when the bill's going through, because my own system I currently use after doing children and young people in post-16 reform, which were quite large bills, was very analogue. I could have done it in the 1970s, you know, so the, that'll be... Because I think that makes a big difference, is being able to physically see how it fits. And it's, I don't know if it's me being a control freak, but I'd rather know exactly where it fits in the bill uh, myself. Much to my wife's disappointment, she had to actually put the post-it notes into the bill herself, you know. So, but one of the things I'd like to ask is uh, your views, Minister, on secondary committees and uh, the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and their input into all of this. There was obviously an incident earlier on in the year where the Finance Committee were, uh, they actually saw a, a revised financial memorandum on the day, on the morning of the stage three. So I was just wondering about your uh, ideas on that. Uh, I mean, so, sometimes these committees cause us a bit of trouble but um, they are invaluable in terms of the, the Parliament's process, and, and particularly finance and um, DPLRC um, have a, a hugely important role to play. I, 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 Minister, if you might care to rephrase that as the, uh, the government and the bill sponsors occasionally cause the committees some trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but it is, is to be welcomed, that, because ultimately we all have an interest in getting robust legislation um, passed through the Parliament, um, so it is, it is absolutely correct that the, these, these committees have, have the role and they continue to have the role, and it's incumbent on us to try and do our best to, to accommodate and facilitate um, their, their um, investigations and, and the work that they do as part of the bill process. So clearly we should always try within the process to give as much time to these committees as, as we can, and you know, there, there's um, per perhaps it's a degree of flagging that up to the subject committees as well to make sure that in terms of the, when they're working out their, their work programme around the bill that they are taking into account um, those committees who have, a, I think, a, a hugely valuable role, the very specialist roles um, which are really, really important. Right, I think that uh, leads us to the conclusion of our questions. Is there anything that uh, any member of the panel wishes to add to our consideration at this stage? No, I think, I mean, as I say, we're continuing to um, uh, watch your, your proceedings with, with interest and we're very keen to work with the committee in any way that we can to, to help take forward some of the, some of the thinking that, that comes out of the inquiry. Uh, right, may I thank you very much for what I think has been a pretty helpful uh, set of inputs. Um, we will leave it to you to judge what we do with them and make your own comments in due course. Uh, thank you very much. I now suspend this meeting until 10.30.
Uh, we'll resume. Agenda item uh, five is to take oral evidence from Rob Gibson, MSP, on the activities of the cross-party groups on Russia and the Scots language. I welcome uh, Rob Gibson to our meeting. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it, it, what we will do is we'll just go straight to questions, if I may, at the, the end of the questions, if there's uh, anything that you, you feel we should know that hasn't otherwise emerged, then you'll have the opportunity to do so. Right, colleagues, Fiona, are you going to kick off? Morning, Rob, and thank you for coming. Um, we've just had a few concerns about the two cross-party groups, Russia and Scots language, and I wondered if you would like to give us a background to it, but specifically what I would like to ask and, and ask you to, to um, address is the fact that the cross-party group in Russia only has four members, and it has to have five MSPs to, to it be established. And the cross-party group in Scots language does have five members, but they're all of one party. Um, so could you talk to us about maybe how the situation has arisen and if you've got any plans of how to address it? OK. Thank you, um, thank you very much for the invite. Um, first of all, I'll take the longest-standing one, which has been in existence since early in the Parliament, the cross-party group for the Scots language. And uh, indeed, at an earlier stage, uh, there were active members from various parties. Indeed, Cathy Peaty was a long-standing convener or vice-convener of that, uh, which gave it um, a breadth. Um, the nominal support of enough members to allow the cross-party group to continue uh, since 2007 has been extremely nominal. Indeed, uh, the circumstances are that it's become less and less of a cross-party group and that in terms of attendance, the only people who attended it were members of the Scottish National Party um, or the Green Party. Uh, and that has made uh, the rules, uh, in contrast to the original founding principle, uh, put at variance with the reality. And there are reasons why the reality has uh, uh, reached that stage, which I can go into later. With regard to the cross-party group for Russia, uh, it was founded by, uh, in the previous parliament briefly, and I resurrected it. Um, I think you could say that um, the uh, secretary and the uh, convener of these groups should take a closer look at the rules under which we are supposed to run. And uh, Mea culpa, in terms of uh, making the cross-party group for Russia uh, fit the rules in terms of members, we had them across three parties. Uh, but we didn't have them in terms of numbers. And when this was drawn to our, our attention uh, forcibly by this committee earlier this year, um, if I can put it mildly, it wasn't the best climate in which to recruit uh, MSPs, the cross-party group for Russia, in the light of the international situation. So uh, the potential for asking other people to join, uh, perhaps uh, you know, on a nominal basis, is there, but we haven't done that for the reasons that the, the actual group has not met uh, during the last six months. Sorry, sorry, too busy writing things down. Um, so, from what you said in the cross-party group in Russia, do you think it's, you're not going to be successful in recruiting an extra member to make it five? Well, I think it's entirely possible that we could be. Um, we have a, a good engagement with uh, the Russian community in this country and with issues related to Russia, uh, and it is certainly possible that we could uh, attempt to do so. I have not attempted to do so during this period uh, in, in order to allow the uh, international situation to play out. However... Um, we did accept uh, an invitation to attend the Russian National Day organised by the Consulate General last week. And I noticed that of the 200 people there, there were from many uh, different strands of Scottish life. So there's no reason to think that we can't ask MSPs to reflect that and uh, to maintain uh, the discussions that we can have at the cross-party group, which have been fruitful in the past. OK. Convener, would it be appropriate then for me to make a suggestion um, that perhaps if, if our committee gave you a date or a deadline 
of um, perhaps after the October recess to see if you can attract and recruit um, enough cross-party membership for your two groups and we could reconsider it again perhaps at a meeting in November. Can I just, before inviting Rob Gibson to, to, to respond to that, just take a sense from the committee whether that's a suggestion that we, we all would... I'm, I'm getting that sense by the nodding heads. Right, Mr Gibson. In that case, um, I think we would try to do that. Um, our intention would be to try and hold an early meeting, if at all possible, in, in August, uh, in order to start that process. So thank you very much for that agreement. It's helpful, indeed. Um, what, what, what do you think uh, your intentions might be in relation to the other group? Well, the cross-party group for Scots. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I've cut across Fiona, who clearly... Yeah, I meant for both groups. You meant for both groups. Well, I see. Right, I beg your pardon. Well, well, in that case, let's be clear what your response is. Then. Well, my response would be in terms of the cross-party group for Scots that um, there was a discussion at the end of 2012 about... Um, the aims and future work of such a cross-party group. And uh, it has to be said that uh, in the period leading up to 2007, there were a lot of issues that had to be campaigned about. There are many more still in general terms which were laid out in a statement of principles which was drawn up in 2003 uh, in that cross-party group. However, since the... Um, accession of uh, the minority and then the majority SNP governments, some of the key uh, campaigning issues have actually been addressed. For example, the Scots Language Learning Centre, which is mainly online, and the Scots Language Dictionaries have been funded directly by the government now, uh, whereas before they were at the mercy of the Scottish Arts Council and uh, doubts about whether they fitted into an arts portfolio were laid aside by that. So these important bodies um, are now directly funded. Um, <clears throat> secondly, um, the uh, census in 2011, which asked for the very first time a question about the use of Scots language, um, was something over which we campaigned for many years. Uh, and indeed, uh, I was a member of the, the um, Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee that dealt with the uh, orders in Parliament to create the uh, questions in the census along with other items. And at that time, there was hostility to having a question asked about Scots from some members of the committee. But it was passed by the majority and indeed that took place very successfully and uh, establishes a precedent to establish the role of Scots in our uh, country's life. It should also be said that the Ministerial Working Group on areas to do with the Scots language has set out a number of aims which are starting to be uh, achieved. So in this Parliament, the work of a cross-party group is uh, truncated by the fact that we actually have a government responding to many of the issues which over the years were campaigned for, but were not actually achieved until after 2007. So... I think it uh, you know, reaches a point where the original ideas of a cross-party group have, in fact, at this time, become less relevant because uh, people have taken a view that uh, there are issues being uh, applied by the government that the campaigning zeal of the cross-party group uh, is less important at the moment and an actual role for any future campaigning is unclear. Uh, so that's why... Um, the cross-party group got more support from uh, members of the governing party in particular and less from opposition parties who didn't give it any priority in the way that the governing party did. So the nature of a cross-party group has been ended and that's why it concerns me that uh, we've attempted to try with outside help to service such a group but we haven't as yet asked people again uh, whether they're prepared to support it, uh, partly because we're not clear just exactly what should be done at the moment, but also we're quite clear that there has been little support from other parties to make it a cross-party group in effect. I think, that, I think that's very clear. Uh, right, can I, can I just say a couple of things? Uh, just... <laughs> 
a tiny wee reference of personal interest to my second cousin, Jim Stevenson, was the editor of the Scots Dictionary for a, for a while. He has, however, been dead for 20 years. So the, the, the so it, it, well, he, I think he did something like L to P, if I recall correctly, something like that. The editors over a very long period of time. However, the, just the technical point, it's as well perhaps to, to, to put into the mix of your consideration. Uh, it may well be that it's actually necessary to have additional members in any group that's meeting, otherwise the meeting is unlikely to be conform in conformance yep. with the rules. So I just invite uh, that that to be part of um, your consideration, Mr Gibson. Cameron. Are you, saying that you think we should disband this group on Scots language? or Because it can't be suspended. It's got to be either disbanded or functioning. Well, well, I'm saying that the rules at the present time make it difficult to meet the, the practical circumstances. Here we have a circumstance where uh, a lot of people who were campaigning for many things are seeing them being uh, applied. Uh, and... Therefore, you might say that their job is done. Well, it's not entirely done, far from it, because Scots doesn't have the status in our country that it uh, could have. However, the practical issues are that in terms of the rules, we can't suspend it during this period. We have to end it. And uh, we haven't ended it because we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, we continued to keep a watching brief, and I have done that as the convener in my role as an MSP in asking questions of ministers about particular aspects of development. So the two things overlap, but the rules are in conflict with this. And I agree with you that in terms of the rules, it should be abandoned at the moment. It should be ended. And if uh, we were to follow them strictly, that's what we would do. We hadn't up to this stage. But if we're instructed to either find uh, cross-party support or to abandon it, then we'll do those. Uh, right. Can I, can I, as a convener, we, 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 we had a suggestion, which we've all uh, signed up to, um, that uh, we're extending the period in which you can look at the matter to the end of the October recess. Um, however, um, if you, as convener, come to an earlier conclusion that it won't be possible to proceed, it would be very helpful if perhaps wearing that role you wrote to the clerks to notify uh, in a formal sense that it will not be possible to proceed. I'm thinking of the Scots language one, where I think your, your comments are substantially less encouraging as to a successful outcome. Um, on the Russian one, I think, I think speaking for myself, um, I, I think in times of difficulty that there may be with a, a, a country like uh, Russia, which is a very important country in the, the, the world, um, the need, perhaps, for having these links um, may even be enhanced. And I, I would certainly personally encourage um, as much work as possible to, uh, to regularise the position, particularly uh, as I heard the indication of a very substantial community engagement across Scotland in uh, Russia's uh, National Day. And indeed, in my constituency responsibilities, I'm working uh, with Russian interests at the moment to... Uh, to see a statue to Michael Barclay de Tolly, who was the uh, field marshal uh, who defeated Napoleon when he invaded Russia, uh, who uh, came from Banff in my constituency. So we're looking to have a statue erected in, uh, later this year in the grounds of Aberdeen University. So I speak with a personal interest in the matter as well. Anything else anyone wishes to say? Right. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Gibson, for your attendance and your very helpful remarks. Thank you. when I'm in private. Right, uh, we now move into private session, please.